Hey there, Nick Jutakis here. In this video, we're gonna go over how to make a Telnet connection using curl. Now, hear me out, there's a pretty interesting use case behind this one, but before we get into that, let's actually see how this works. So we can use Telnet protocol here, connect to some type of host on whatever port that we want. You know, in this case, we're gonna do a very basic example to connect over HTTP, and then we can actually make an HTTP request. So we can go to the root address here, you know, we can put in the protocol version as well as the host header, which will be in this case, example.com, hit enter twice, and boom, we get a response back from the server. There's all of our HTTP email and the body of the response, as well as different headers that we get here. Now, we did use curl-v here that gives us a little bit more information. For example, you know, we can see that we're connected to example.com, et cetera, et cetera. Nice little details about the connection. If we don't use dash v, then we won't see that, but we can still make our request here. So if we do HTTP 1.1 host example.com, you know, we'll get the same information back here. There's the body response, there's the headers, et cetera. But yeah, if I'm doing this, I kind of like to use dash v just because I like to see that connection information. Now, you might be wondering, uh, why on earth would you ever use curl to make a telnet connection to uh, some website to make an HTTP request because I'm pretty sure curl was made to make that process a little bit easier just by doing example.com and it does all this information for us or if we do it with a dash V here then it will give us uh, the header information back as well. Yep. So in this case, you know, you really wouldn't probably be using this to make an HTTP request. You know, we just did that for an example, but um. Yeah, let's get into this use case here. For me specifically, it was related to running something in a Kubernetes cluster. But again, this example has nothing really to do with Kubernetes or containers or Docker or anything like that. But yeah, imagine this scenario. Imagine you have a Kubernetes cluster running and you have a web application that's running there. It's happily, everything is working nicely. And now you just want to experiment. Maybe you want to run a new service, something like Redis, and you just want to make sure that, you know, Redis comes up successfully. And more importantly, your web application pod or container is able to connect to Redis over Kubernetes local network. And then also go, you know, as far as an end-to-end -end test, maybe you want to be able to run some Redis commands there against that server from that web application just to make sure it works. And you can actually do that over Telnet. But now let's say that your web application container doesn't have Telnet installed. You know, NC might not be installed either, but you do have curl installed. And you also have some security uh, checks in place there for the configuration of that pod. For example, you know, maybe you're running things as a non-root user, as well as having your root file system to be read-only. So you couldn't just like, you know, exec into that pod and then like apt install telnet for you. You know, in this case, you just can't install any new tools. So yeah, it would be nice just to be able to use curl there just to make a telnet connection to Redis there to see how that stuff works. In fact, we can actually demonstrate that one real quick here. You know, if I go to my example, I think Flask application here. Yeah, so this is going to have uh, Redis and a web application are already set up here. You know, it's not specific to Kubernetes again. We can just see everything running here. You know, in this case, Postgres, blah, 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 Redis worker web, you know, all these things are running now. Uh, but if we jump into a shell for the web container, which is a shortcut to do that here, you know, we can see in this case, I'm actually running as a Python user. So if I tried to, you know, do something like, uh, like an app get update, that's just not going to work here uh, because that needs to be done as the root user and like sudo isn't installed here. So that's also not going to work as well. Uh, but in this case, you know, you can also see like telnet is just not available to run, but curl is available to run here. So yeah, we can actually see how all of this works. So now let's just use that same example as we did before, but th in this case, we're gonna change around some host names and actually make a TCP connection to the Redis server and run some Redis commands here. Again, not limited to Redis, but let's actually see how this works here. So we can make a curl request to Telnet, just like we did before. You know, in this case, we're gonna use Redis as the host name because, you know, if I jump into uh, the application code here real quick for the Docker Compose YAML file, you know, somewhere down here, I'll just do a search for it. Uh, we have this Redis service here. So our application can connect over Redis as a host name there. That's just how, you know, nice things set up from Docker networking there. But in this case, we'll connect to uh, 6379. That's the port for Redis here. And here we have an actual connection open. Actually, let me rerun that one with dash V again. So it's nice to see this connection information here. So this is, yeah, the internal uh, IP address here for the Docker network. And let's see what we can actually do. So with Redis, you know, we're not going to be making like an HTTP request, but there is a command that you can run like keys that star, which is going to list all of the keys in your Redis server. In this case, there's a couple of them because this application happens to use Celery, which is a background worker, and it's using Redis as a backend here. But we can demonstrate here like, yo, we just connected to Redis and we were able to run a command successfully. And, you know, if I were doing an end-to-end -end test, I would actually be really happy about this result. You know, we demonstrated the network is accessible. This port is listening for something, and then we're able to actually run Redis commands. So now you can think like, well, okay, cool. So, 
you know, in this case, it's not a Kubernetes cluster, but you can be like, okay, Redis is configured correctly. It's up and running. Everything is good to go. Now you can maybe modify your application's configuration to connect to this locally running ver version of Redis instead of something else or, you know, whatever you happen to be doing there in your use case. So, uh, by the way, I just want to also point out too that, you know, we're getting all this information back for the happy case, you know, when things are actually working, but like what happens when things don't work? Because it's kind of interesting. You can, you can see all sorts of different types of error messages depending on, you know, if like the host name didn't exist or maybe the port isn't accessible. So if we try to connect to something like Redis123, you know, we can see right away that curl is like, hey, I can't resolve that host here. You know, this just like doesn't exist, right? So we're going to get, um, could not resolve host there. But let's just say that, uh, you know, the host does exist here and you tried to connect on a different port here that isn't accessible, then you will get a completely different error message here saying that, hey, you know, this host is accessible. However, you know, this port, we just can't accept a connection there. So if you're trying to debug something or troubleshoot some error, you know, these are different types of error messages that you would get depending on what potentially may went wrong. Yeah, that's basically going to do it for this video. Uh, let us know in the comments below if you've ever had to do this or wanted to do this or will do this in the future. And if you have any questions, I'll do my best to answer all of them. Uh, with that said, if you like the video, please give it a thumbs up. Thanks a lot for watching and I'll see you in the next video.